the Rebbe Lubavitch Rebbe was very, very strong about, came out very strong about making sure that children are, the, the images they see and the toys that they have should be only kosher animals. You shouldn't have a teddy bear. It should be, it could be a sheep, it could be a cat, whatever it is, it should be kosher. everybody and welcome to the Pray Hard, Play Hard YouTube channel and podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, thank you for being here. I'm a little bit under the weather, so please excuse the occasional sniffle and sneeze. Right, welcome back. Please uh, smash that like button. Don't forget to share. Hopefully you find this uh, informative and entertaining. That's right. Today's Parsha is? Today's Parsha is? Truma. Truma. Mm -hmm. says Truma. Mm -hmm. And which literally means uplifting or a spiritual uplift, a spiritually uplifting. That's correct. Truma to let Um to lift up. Wow. When I was learning about right, out, right off the bat with every Torah, just like that. That's right. <laughs> when I was learning about it. What really caught my attention was um, one of the opinions says that when uh, Avram Avinu was supposed to slaughter his son Itzchak. When he heard Hashem tell him that you will take your son and you will go and you will shecht your son, he was actually happy about the idea. Why? Because he thought that he's in a way uplifting his son's spirit to become one with Hashem. Right. And, and, and that did happen spiritually. Right. That, that did happen spiritually. But we as, as mortals, we, we think differently. Oh my God, how can a father go and kill his son? So in a way, in, in, in one opinion, he was actually happy about the situation because he thought that his son had the merit to, to be uplifted at that, time, at that moment. Very interesting. It's just an opinion. It's one of them. No, them. I mean, for, first of all, 100% that both Avraham and Yitzchak, once they knew what Hashem had asked, they did it with happiness, mm -hmm. and they did it. They didn't drag on, you know. So when somebody has to do something unpleasant, normally they drag their feet. They did it with zrizus. Mm -hmm. um, there was a whole dialogue of them going back and forth on, oh no, 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 I should do this. He says, no, 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 you should do this. And then he says, but father, but uh, you're the high priest. If you, if uh, I do the killing, then then you become tame, and the the whole back and forth. Mm. And I was like, oh wow, this is this is. This is something, these details that most people, most the books don't talk about. Yeah, the, med the Midrashim around how Avram and Yitzchak, from when they st left to go to the Akeda until it actually happened, um, is, are amazing. Satan, you know, took a bunch of different forms to stop them from being able to do it. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. it says that one of the things that happened was he turned himself into a river. Right, right. And they went all the way up to their noses and then, you know... And then Avram says, well, I've done all I can. And the, the rest is up to you. And then, it vanishes. boom, it just yeah. goes away. So he was a master of illusions. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was a master of illusions. That's why how he tried to persuade Avram from, from doing what he had to do. Yeah. I'm talking about the evil inclination. The, the Satan, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Satan. Okay, where is my notebook? Oh. Oh, I hope I brought it. Oh, here it is. Thank God. Sniffle time. <laughs> <laughs> the Parsha talks about all the different things about... All the different things in the Mishkan, how to build the Mishkan. So first, it says that everybody was able to give toward the Mishkan. They gave gold, silver, everybody had copper, mm -hmm. right? And they all had, you know, they were able to give. And then it talks about the dimensions, what it's made of, mm -hmm. all the different um, utensils, the mizbeach. So it goes into detail, the measurements, you know, uh, and and uh, the different uh, dyes that they used. It basically is all um, about how, number one, how the Jews. Uh, donated to the Mishkan, and then how the Mishkan is supposed to be built. Mm -hmm. That's okay. that's the, how the, the 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 sum up of the parsha. And some of the things it says in the par one of the things it says in the parsha is, 
talks about Telas Shani, right? Mm -hmm. That is a type of, I think it's a reddish type of dye. Mm -hmm. And it's called Telas Shani. Telas means a worm. So there's, an, the, 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 from the Gemara Bavli, the Talmud Bavli, mm -hmm. it seems that they used not an actual worm, but a seed, uh, a plant that has a seed, and in every seed there's a worm, and therefore it's called Telas Shani. It's called a worm. Okay. But really, they used, um, they, they used the plant. But according to the Yerushalmi, Talmud Yerushalmi, the Yerushalmi Gemara, it seems that they actually used the actual worm. Or something that came from the worm. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't we have a huge conflict now? Because everything that was used in the Mishkan, everything and anything, had to come either from a kosher animal or, or had to be plant-based. That's a very, very, very good... That's, that's, that's what I was about to ask. It's a very good question. So, the, it, it was supposed to come from kosher animals. That's why, according to the Talmud Bavli, it says that everything, no matter what, was tahar. Mm -hmm. Now... Because as we know, the only kosher insect we could think of is a grasshopper, and there's only a couple of species that are edible. The rest, we can't eat. We can't ingest any right. insect. No, it was definitely not a kosher. Even according to the Talmud Yerushalmi that says it was the worm itself, it wasn't a kosher animal. Okay. But there's actually a, a Hassam Sefer. He talks about how come we use... Um, I don't know if he was talking about silk... He was talking about a different worm that from its spit it creates... Uh, okay, okay. It's yeah, probably, probably silk. silk. Okay. It's probably silk. He's saying, how is it that we use silk uh -huh. when, when uh, it's not from a kosher animal? And he brought down someone who said that everything in, in a show should only be made you know, from kosher stuff. Uh -huh. So he comes... He, he, he answered it by saying that since it's totally made a new thing, it's turned into a totally new thing, it's not like you're taking hides of an animal, for example, and you, it's still the same thing. You take it, you break it down, and you turn it into something totally new, so therefore it's, it's not considered like it's coming from a non-kosher animal, and it's okay. Okay. So that's, that could be an answer to the Yerushalmi, why the Yerushalmi says like this. So that brings me to the next question. Yeah. Can you have the curtain of the, of the what's his name, um, uh, of the bima, made of silk? Probably. You are allowed? Probably. I think that's what he was saying. I think he was saying that they used a lot of the things in the shul, they used it from, 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 from this thing. Now, Lamaisa, you can, you can go both ways. You understand? You could say it's okay, but, you know, personally, a person could say, no, I want it to be only, only kosher. You okay. know what I mean? But again, that resolves the, the... It would make more sense to just say, simply, that there was nothing non-kosher used. Okay. You know, which is interesting though, because there was an actual worm that helped cut the stones right, on the base of the shamir. But it wasn't actually right the shamir worm. But it, but that doesn't mean anything because the materials themselves weren't right, from right. the shamir. He was just cut. Right. Uh, nothing came from him. Right. Right. There's actually an incredible story of how Shlomo Hamelach got the shamir worm. Right. 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 Crazy story. Uh -huh. Maybe maybe we'll get there some at some point. I, I just want to kind of segue for a second or digress into an idea of in general having only kosher things. The Rebbe, the Babish Rebbe, was very, very strong about, came out very strong about making sure that children are, the, the images they see and the toys that they have should be only kosher animals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because this is something you, you see, and not necessarily is it even so stressed in other very, even ultra orthodox um, circles. There was very, very careful that everything should be kosher and tar. That, that, you know, a kid shouldn't, shouldn't have a teddy bear. He shouldn't be... Um, too attached to... He shouldn't be attached to a teddy bear. A teddy bear right? Meaning, you, you get attached to your toys. Teddy bear, right? You, should, you shouldn't have a teddy bear. It should be... It could be a sheep. It could be a cat. Whatever it is, it should be kosher. You know? Just off subject, on the news a while ago, there was a man that climbed into... In a zoo, climbed into a cage of a koala bear. And he thought, oh, a koala bear, so cute. <laughs> Yeah, and the koala bear ripped him apart. Oh God! Don't forget, it's still a bear. Right. You know, so the reality is, unfortunately, nowadays a lot of kids grow up in in a huge metropolis in any huge city. They don't know domestic animals or or uh, wild animals. <laughs> so that's a that's a funny thing actually, because because I I don't look 
particularly fondly, or I, I don't think it's a good idea to make like friendly crocodiles or like, right. just, like what are you doing? Like, you know, but they do it for the sake of a story and the storyline. Listen, and it's fairy cool. Tales it makes sense. Yeah. But, but, but I'm just saying like, mm -hmm. listen, you know what? I, there's, there's a, there's a, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I, I just think. I just think it's better to represent, even for little children, a world, even if it's a fantastical world, that's more, you know, something that's more um, representative of truth than, than fantasy. Like, whatever real, it is. Real like, life, 100%. You know, and, uh, when, as a kid, I used to love watching nature and, and, and uh, you know, nature, uh, um, uh, Discovery Channel and all of these things. So we knew about nature. We knew who Jacques Cousteau was. You know, we loved that type of a thing. Nowadays, I ask my son, you want to watch something like that? Ah, I'm not interested. Cause, cause like, what do you mean? He would rather watch something that is, you know, constantly stimulating. So here's, here's the thing. They don't want to watch nature anymore. We live in a generation that everything is, they may turn everything hyper palatable. Right? I, I, myself, like, like, fruit is delicious. But... If I wasn't, if I just wanted to go for the thing that made me feel the most good in the moment, I'd go for some sour candy, you know, they, they, mm -hmm. they make it super sour, super, right? Because number one, it's less of a mess, straight out of a bag, you know, peel this and that. Mm -hmm. And it just, they, they make it hyper palatable. They take all the parts that make it really good and just jam it all together. They, they, they concentrate it. They exaggerate it. They do that with, with, with everything. They do it with cartoons. They do it with, with food. They do it with. But that's not so in real life. And that's why for kids afterwards, everything is boring. Yeah. It's very hard to get them excited about things. When you, when you serve everything on a silver platter to somebody, you know, if, you, if somebody lives their, 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 who knows, whatever part of their life without doing any hard work, and they don't know what hard work is, they don't know what it means to earn something. It's a torture for them to do so now. Yeah. It's, so it's, 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 that's, why, that's why I say, like, anything that's given to children, children shouldn't, like, Children need entertainment, children, but it has to be in a way that will model what grown-up life will be, just in a way that's good for them. You know, if you come up with a reward system for a child, good. Do it in a way where he'll develop good ethics for real life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, like, the, teaching a kid to be responsible with money is a good thing. Giving him an allowance for nothing, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? So... The, it is what it is. <laughs> I tried something I saw um, online. Usually I take my son to shul. Yeah. Shul, all the people that see him, everybody wants to give him candy. Oh, cute kid, this and that. So he comes to me. He says, Papa, can I have, I have three candies in my pocket. Can I have it? I told him, no, we have to come back from shul. After food, you could have. And he says, okay, I'll three, have all three. I'll tell him, no, after food, you could have one. And at the end of the day, after you had your last meal, you could have two more. An hour before you go to sleep. No, I don't want to. I want to eat all of them. So I tell them, if that's the case, if you're giving me the ultimatum, I'm going to give you the ultimatum. You can only have one. He thought about it, thought about it. He says, you know what? I want all three. So he agreed. He agreed to have one now and two later. Mm. But that builds within him. You know, that, that urge to want it and, and go crazy about it to make me do it didn't happen because we reached an agreement. So he got what he wanted. He was, gonna, he was able to eat all three candies that day. And at the same time, I got what I wanted. I got him to spread it out throughout the day. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. See, that's, that's, yeah, that's exactly so it. So you have to compromise. Or do I want him to have three candies that day? No. But I don't, definitely don't want him to have all three of them on the same time. Right. Yeah. That, <laughs> that makes sense. And, and, it, and, it, and even that, practicing self-control, even if it's just self-control for another five minutes, still is helping wire the brain differently than you would if it was just everything at once. But going back to the kosher animals, so, you know, to be attached, the, 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 the point, I mean... You could talk about this about exactly why, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a. I've had this discussion with a lot of people. Exactly, what does it mean? You know, some people are so careful, even if you know, 
gap will have, you know, a teddy bear for the baby stuff. You know, some people be like, no. Some people be like, ah, it's just a teddy bear on the, on the table. But the point is that... It builds attachment. Well, I mean, a, a, and it's a kid's going to... Yeah, a kid's going to be more attached to a teddy bear that he holds and, you know, a little bear on his shirt he'd probably never even look at. Who mm-hmm. knows? Depending on the kid. But, but the point is that to, to, from the moment a child is born, really from before the child is born, you know, mm-hmm. To, to, to surround them with only pure and holy things. And people sometimes think, oh, you know, he's a little kid, it doesn't matter. It matters the most. Those are his foundation. When you're planting a tree, oh, I'm going to plant it. Oh, it's, it's going a little bit this way. Oh, it's just the beginning. No, if you leave it like that, it's going to plant crooked it's his whole life. It's going to completely deviate from where it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. P- people have a very interesting idea, you know, like, uh, of... of it's not detached, you know, like, oh, kids and adults. It's all, it's all one, th- you're, you're, it's preparation. You're tra- transitioning yeah. into becoming adults. And yeah, you know, every day we put out what they, they're uh, absorbing. Yeah, and, and, I mean, and you see, and, and you see it the most from what's happening in the world. You know, there, there's, there's such a fight for what children should be exposed to. Because people know, everybody knows, that whatever the, the youth are exposed to, whatever, if you win over the youth, you win over the next generation. Everybody knows this. That's why in Russia they drafted, you know, the Jewish kids when they were very little, because otherwise they knew they was they were gone. Right. They had they, no chance, mm-hmm. you know, and they still lost, you know, the, the war. They 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 won a few battles, but uh, we still stood strong. Um, well, Purim is coming up. We'll save it for Purim. <laughs> so we'll get there. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, I'm going on a long thing, but but but. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to be, be careful about what our children hear, what they see. We have to, you know, I'm talking to myself. It's so easy to, yeah, he's a kid or whatever. You know, you talk about whatever it is. No, a child learns, taking everything that they, that they see and, and that they uh, And it's our responsibility hear. as parents to be vigilant about what they're exposed to. Mm, yeah. Because unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the government has their best uh, interest at heart. There, it's, it's so, it's, I, 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 the things that I've seen... You know, the subliminal... I mean, listen, I remember seeing a cartoon that wasn't exactly, let's say, I would not show it to my own kid, right? As a, as a kid. I remember till today the cartoon, and I, I, I know that it made an impression on me at that age that maybe it wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have had exposure to that thing or to that idea if I didn't see that. Like we, we, people like to kind of, you know, ignorance is bliss. We like to look away, like not really, like, this is, it's real. Like the, the secular, me, like media for children is a no-no. It has its own agenda. It's uh, obvious it has an agenda. But even if it didn't, even if it didn't have an agenda, they're just doing cute things for kids. The, sec, the secular idea of what's kosher for kids is not at all aligned with what really is okay for kids according to Torah and what, you know. So, so. I, again, I'm going on a super tangent, but it's something I really am super passionate about. It's like, no, <laughs> you need to be very careful about what you show your kid. Because once you become a parent, you start thinking about it. You start seeing this. Yeah, and, and now, thank God, you know, it used to be there was not so much material. Now there's so much out there that's kosher for kids. There are websites, entire websites that are just, you know, geared for, for child-appropriate kosher. My son, to this day. I, he has an iPad that he watches mm. with uh, his nieces and uh, with, with his uh, cousins when they're together. Because I give him about an hour, an hour and a half of, of uh, screen time. Mm. After Shabbos, you, they, you, they've been good, they learned, all of that. Then I give him an hour and a half of, of screen time when, when, they bo- when all of them enjoy together. Mm. At the same time, I have to make sure that I'm one eye in there to make sure that they're not watching anything inappropriate. Or they're not going on websites they're not supposed to or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. I already have parental control there. But the parental control is not as good as everybody thinks it is. Not only that, even the things that are, again, even the things that are appropriate for kids, they they make jokes in there. They make things, you know. So That's why you have to watch what they're watching. You have to make sure you know what they're watching. I remember he was watching this uh, one uh, Minecraft video by a YouTuber that that is concentrating on little kids and then he made a couple of jokes and i heard them and i was like what in the world is he talking about <laughs> I was like, like that's not for kids 
There you go. You know? There and you so go. I had to make sure that I, I blocked them so they don't watch them again. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then not only that, on especially on YouTube, there are all types of weirdos that are coming up and making new accounts. I think it was called Huggy Wuggy or something like that. <laughs> no, you're laughing, but it sounds like it's a cute YouTuber, right? Apparently he was putting up all types of gaudy things. Like, you know, blood and, and yeah, killing yeah. And, and, and the weird things like that and telling kids to do, uh, to, to cause harm to their bodies. Oh, yeah. And kids were doing it, apparently. So that's why you have to be very careful to what they are exposed to. Yeah, wow. We went on a real, on a real rant. It's true. Yeah. It's insane. It is, yeah. It's but it goes crazy. to show you how low we have come spiritually. I'm talking about in this physical world that we live in. Oh yeah, society. We have spiritually fallen so low. Yeah. That. But you know what? Always exposing kids to this filth. But but we also like we can give ourselves a pat on the back that we live in, in all this filth and we still can see the truth and you know Baruch Hashem you know we have Torah we have it like really like we it's it's yeah. a it's a big deal like, we shouldn't play it down. Um, Anyway, <laughs> getting back to uh, Teruma, right? To uh, the, the, the silk, the, the, right? So, so it actually says something very interesting. Mm -hmm. That um, I think Balitasis brings this down. I, I didn't this particular point. I didn't write who wrote this. It says wearing silk and making nice clothing out of silk is actually something that it can enhance humility. Why? Because it reminds a person. It's made out of worms, right? So it reminds mm -hmm. a person that. What's the end of a person? They go back to the earth and they're eaten by worms. So it's a constant reminder to be humble. Don't, you know, don't be too high and mighty. Mm -hmm. Because uh, everyone, everyone returns to the dirt. So it's an interesting idea. You know, silk is, is very luxurious on the one end. And the, on, the, on the other hand... Don't also, forget where you came from. Yeah. Um, now... One of the things that are that we know was the, 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 a lot of the things of the Mishkan were made out of the, the materials were made out of tachash. Mm -hmm. Tachash was a special animal that was very colorful that was only around for the specific purpose of the Mishkan. So Hashem sent it, sent it down, and then afterwards, after they had the, the materials, it. it what kind of animal living. was it? Was it a bird-like animal? No, no, no. Was I it think, a no, horned I, animal? Was it so a, I think it said it had one horn. Okay. I think, I think so it, was, it was like a unicorn. Unicorn. I think, again, okay. I could be... I believe there's, a, there's an appearance of one horn. I... I uh, did, did, did it resemble a horse? I mean, is that where we got the unicorn idea? I, listen, every... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's a funny... It's a funny, uh, you know... Is there a promise that we will have that we will see that animal again when Mashiach comes, or so that's, no? That's very interesting. Or it's like, not one of those. I things. would like to see. This. I mean, there are some explanations and 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 descriptions of what it was like, but I didn't look that up this week. But we know it was very colorful, and it says something very interesting um, in Yecheskel. It says, "And Al Chatachash, I will like now could be to to to." close in or to or to or now nah, like shoes mm -hmm. so it says i will put shoes on you i'll outfit you or outfoot you mm -hmm. get it outfit outfoot mm -hmm. jewish dad jokes um but uh you tried bro <laughs> <laughs> it's the effort that counts <laughs> i will outfoot you with tachash okay. so the maharal of prague says um that hashem brought many Tchash and many of these animals in the Midbar that the Jews should be able to, to get for the Mishkan. And they hunted a lot of them. They, they captured a lot of them. Okay. And they made, they, they had a lot of leftover and they, used, they made shoes out of them. Okay. Out of the Tachash. They made shoes out of them. And the Targum Shir Hashir. So at that time, the forest was full of them. The, the, the desert, they, I guess, in the surroundings, there were Tachash. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and they just, they, they, they trap okay. a lot of them. And the, the translation of Shir Hashirim in the Targum, it says that the Jews, well, this is the Aramaic translation, it says that the Yidin went up to Yerushalayim with shoes made out of Tachash. Mm -hmm. Now, normally you're not allowed to go into the Harabayas. Once you get on the Harabayas, you have to take off your shoes. Right. But the, very interestingly, the, the Satmar Rebbe, the, the Divrei Yoel says 
that because these shoes were not, they weren't considered to be of the earth. Hashem sent them from Shemai. So therefore they're different and therefore... So therefore there's no Tamei. It's so possible. Uh, 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 it's possible. He says it's a possibility that they were able to even walk in the Harabai. That with, makes sense. Wow. Okay. okay that's powerful. Wow. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then he brings down, and I forget from who, who he brought this down. No, I don't think he said. I think he... Because he referred to... Um, he just, by the, in this Sefer, Eitzer Plei Satera, he writes, refer back to where I wrote about Adam and Chava. So I'm guessing it's in Bereshis, mm -hmm. where he writes that the, the, it says Hashem made kosnais or he made them, you know, clothing that, that would cover them. So there's an, there's an opinion that says that it's possible that that was also made out of tachash, that it was made out of the tachash, that it was a special uh, clothing. Not just any hide, but the hide of the tachash. But that was all the Jews, everybody? No, 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 Adam, no, ah. Adam and Chava. Ah, okay, it says okay. that Hashem made, once they realized that they were unclothed, ah, okay. Hashem made them clothing. Okay. So it's possible that the clothing was made out of tachash. So okay. they had colorful, they had colorful clothing. Um, now, hmm. yeah. So this is like, yeah. This is all I got, especially except for one last thing. You got anything else? Anything else in the parsha? Well, uh, what about the fact that we were supposed to give half a shekel? Or am I going too far That's ahead? That's Kisisa. Yeah, I am going too far ahead. It's Kisisa. <laughs> but uh, about, about giving, so actually it says that there were three main materials as far as um, metals that were given in the Mishkan. What were those? There was gold, silver, silver and copper. copper. Uh -huh. right? Gold, silver, and copper. Mm -hmm. so, so, this is a hint for three types of Jews. Mm -hmm. You have a Baal Tshuva, right? someone who did Tshuva after he did a sin. And actually it says that a Baal Tshuva is higher than a Tzaddik. Mm -hmm. Then you have a Tzaddik. Mm -hmm. so, so the Zahav, which is the highest type form of metal, right? Definitely out of the three, that's the Baal Tshuva. Mm -hmm. Kesef, which is, you know, um, which is still very, very so, precious. That's a Tzaddik. That's a, you know, someone who never sinned. I mean, it's, it's very, you know, it's very high level. And then you have the Cheshesh Copper. That is, you know, the least, um, the, the, the least precious. And that's alluding to Russia. Someone who is a sinner. Right. And yet, even in Russia, if he's polished enough, he, he will shine. First of all, yeah. But, but it's, it's saying that there's no Jew. This, this is, a, this is a, a hint that there's no Jew that can claim the Mishkan's not for me. Mm -hmm. A tzaddik can say, you know, I deal with things that are not with this world. I study, I learn Torah, you know, that's, the, I don't mean, a mishkan, what was the mishkan? Taking the physical world, which can be used for either good or for bad, and using it for the highest purpose. Mm -hmm. Tzadik doesn't need that, because he's a, you know, so it says, no, no, no. He's already at the high, uh -huh. Yes, he says, no, 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 no. You, need, you, you need to participate in the mishkan. The mishkan, mm -hmm. you have to make a, a, you have to participate in the dwelling place of Hashem down here. Mm -hmm. don't, don't worry about the heavens. Down here. The Baal Shuvah can also say, that I no longer am in that world. I have done tshuva. I won't, I don't have the potential to misuse um, the physical world. And, and I don't need that. I don't, Mishkan is not my Aveda. Right? I'm also going to stick to the, you know, world constant thing. tshuva, constant, constantly remembering, you know, that, that I want to cleave to Hashem. Also, so, so you know, the Mishkan is not for me. Mm -hmm. So he says, no, also you have to make sure that you make a, 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 a dwelling place for Hashem, you deal with the Mishka. And the Russia will say, I'm too far gone. What do I have to do with the Mishka? It's not for me. Mm -hmm. And the the copper, the, the, the Russia, he also, he has to deal, he has, to, he, he has a place in the Mishka. So much so that the light of, that, that shines in the Mishka will also affect him. So what, is that, what does that tell us nowadays for you know, in, in, in... 
Yeah. What, is that, what, is that, what does that say for, for, for nowadays? What is, what is a Mishkan for us nowadays? A Mishkan is like the Mishkan was back then physically. It's a dwelling place for Hashem. And when we serve God here mm-hmm. in the physical world, when we, not when we run away from the physical, but we deal with the physical and we do as many mitzvahs as we can and we turn every part of our life into service of Hashem, that's creating a dwelling place for Hashem. And there's no Jew who doesn't take a part in that. There's no such thing as I'm too holy or I'm too far gone. I'm, you know, I have no connection. Every single Jew has a connection. And you see, you know, when once upon a time, putting on tefillin on somebody in the street, there was a question if you should do it, right? Mm-hmm. When, when it was just mm-hmm. starting the whole revolution, people were like, how do you do it? They, you don't know what he's thinking. Every Jew needs to make a dwelling place for Hashem. Every Jew needs to bring light here. And if I'm putting on tefillin and the guy in the street is not, my avoda is affected. I have a responsibility for him and, and only when, when, when I make sure that he does it is the, this world that has to become a dwelling place, is it complete? So this is a very, you know, everyone in our own life, we can find an area where we can involve godliness, where maybe we didn't bring godliness in as much as we can. And that's our job. Yeah, I meant to that. That's the, that's the hint of Zav, Akesaf, and Achishas, that every single person has a right and has an obligation to learn Torah and do mitzvahs to, to make this place... To bring holiness into this world. Yeah, into to make this place a, a place where Hashem can, Hashem's light can shine. Mm-hmm. Mashiach should come and should, should, we should have it here. Amen. Below Ten Tfachim, you know. That's right. We want Mashiach now. We want Mashiach now. Not later. Now. Now, now, now. <laughs> And the whole point of Torah is to uplift spiritually this physical world. Oh, so that's, that's, that embodies the whole parsha. Right. Teruma means and elevating how do we, to Hashem. Uh, how do we elevate this whole world spiritually? By doing hesed, by doing good things, by doing good deeds, bringing people closer and closer to, uh, to, to the Torah and uh, inspiring others to do the same. Not with a reward, but to do it for... For, for the sake of the Torah, because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's the whole point of this whole Parsha. Of course, we deviate a lot, but uh, hopefully you enjoy our conversations. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for joining the Pray Hard, Play Hard YouTube channel and podcast. Thank you for uh, making it till the end. If you did, you're an absolute legend. Thank you for bearing with my cold, my sniffles, and my sneezes. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Smash that like button. It's Don't free. forget to share. I hope you uh, find this informative and uh, entertaining. And we will see you next week. Shabbat Shalom. Yes, good Shabbos. <laughs> oh, one second. We forgot. What did we forget? It's, it's Rosh Chodesh. Oh, yes. It's Rosh Chodesh. It's Rosh Chodesh. Adar. Marvin we Simcha. We should have so much Simcha. We should bring Simcha into our Amen. life. Happiness and joy. We should greet Mashiach with Simcha. Amen. Should, should we do a somersault? The COVID Rosh Chodesh Adar? You're a little under the weather, man. Rufrosh Lema to our... No, but that's... Our... <laughs> that's when you have to... Go for it, man. Go for it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to record you. you Go to, for it. You have to break it with Simcha. <laughs> simcha, Simcha, Simcha. Okay. Got it? One, two, three, Go. Opa! There we go, there you go. <laughs> Did you survive it? Do you need a hand? <laughs> I've done I've done better, but it works. Welcome back, everybody. Let's let me let me no, no, no. yeah yeah. I let know. me sit down, bro. Broski, broski. Okay. So how do you go? <laughs> 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 breathe, breathe. Yes, 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 yes. Oxygenate your blood first.